praying especially for the service that God would make his presence known to us, speak to our minds and our hearts. My mother was in the kitchen preparing dinner for our family. And she looked over at the kitchen table and little Mary was busily drawing pictures. And the mother said, Mary, what are you drawing? And she said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the mother said, but Mary, nobody knows what God looks like. She said, they will when I finish my picture. I want to use that as we look at Philippians 2, our scripture today. Because I want us to conceptualize and practice what little Mary was doing in our minds and hearts as we move through this passage of scripture. It's printed in your bulletin. If you have your Bible, turn to Philippians 2 as I read the 11, first 11 verses. Apostle Paul writing to the church of Philippi says that there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind in you, or among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who thought it, though he was in the form of God, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed him in the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> May God add his blessings to this portion of his word. This is a rich passage of scripture. I hope you picked up on that just in the reading this morning. It's definitely one of my favorite passages of scripture, though I don't want to shortchange any of the other passages in the Bible in saying that. Some time ago, as I was putting together and praying about a list of topics that I felt God would have me to speak on during my time with you, when you hear at St. Paul, the message of this passage was one of those, one of those topics. But just this past week in some of my reading from the newspaper and book reviews, I came across two very timely articles dealing with this very topic, which reassured me that this is a very timely topic, not just for us here, but for our culture in general. I'll mention at least one of those articles briefly as, as I continue with this passage. So here's the premise that I want you to understand that I'm working from as we move through Philippians 2. Christianity is about relationships and truth. Christianity about relationships. As a matter of fact, if you look on the sidebar of your bulletin where the notes for sermons can be, you will see my copyrighted definition of Christianity. Christianity is the religion of truth. 
fleshed out in relationships vertically and horizontally. Christianity is the religion of truth fleshed out in relationships vertically and horizontally. That's what Christianity is all about. Therefore, if you are a Christian this morning, your life is about truth and relationships. Based on Paul's words here in this passage of Scripture, we have a reminder of what we have already learned from looking at other passages of Scripture. And that is that God has made us to be in relationship with Him and with one another. As our Creator God, He is a personal God, and any proper worldview that we might embrace will include both horizontal and vertical relationships in that worldview. Knowing God as He reveals Himself to us in His Word implies that there is some kind of relationship between us and Him. And we need to remember that. Actually, it's a relationship of dependence. For in Him, we live and move and have our being. Without Him, we're nothing. We were made in the very beginning to relate to God. And we were made to relate to God in specific ways. We look at our text and use Paul's description of how we were made to relate to God. Here's what we would find. We were made to be united to God, to receive comfort from His love, and to have fellowship with His Spirit. Union, comfort, and fellowship. Three wonderful things. And that's what Adam had with God in the beginning of creation before sin entered the picture. And what could be better than a relationship with God described by those words. Union, comfort in love, fellowship in the spirit. But God said something very interesting to Adam. He said, Adam, you have all those things. Your relationship with me and your relationship with the world around you. But that's not enough. There's something missing in your life. It's not good for man to be alone. Now, you understand, you can be alone and not be lonely. Or you can be in the midst of a crowd and be lonely. But here's the point I want you to see, that before sin entered into the picture, God said, there's a loneliness in your life. And this is before sin. There's something that's missing in your life. So you see, theoretically, if everything can be right between us and God, and this other thing is missing, our life is not only incomplete, but there's the experience of loneliness. Can only be dispelled by other human beings. God made us for togetherness. God made us for companionship. God didn't make us to live in isolation or loneliness. He made us to live in the context of community, in relation to others.
Sin didn't cause us to need other people. God caused us to need other people by the way he created us. God made us for that togetherness and for that companionship to live in community with, with one another. Because he made us to be relational beings. And when I read this article this past week, it said in the past 30 years, according to this study, which was done with more than 300,000 people as an audience, that loneliness in America has doubled. From 1980, it was 20% of American people who said they were lonely. Today, it's 40% that say they're lonely. We have to ask why. And we have to conclude <clears throat> that one of the reasons loneliness is such a problem today is because of a person and people's relationship with God. There is less and less, according to this study, of person-to-person -person contact today than at any other time in our history. Now looking at Paul's words, here's the scenario. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Oh, that's heavy. If we understand what Paul is saying, that's heavy stuff. Because what he says and implies is that God intended for us to have close, warm, meaningful, interpersonal relationships. He says this, and listen carefully so I'll not be misunderstood. The same kind of relationship that we have with God is to resemble the kind of relationship we have with each other. Let me say that again. The same kind of relationship that we have with God is to resemble the kind of relationship we have with each other. How do you hear that make you feel? It really hits home for me as I realize, and I've been living with this text for some time, what it means. I hope you caught it already in my brief comments so far this morning. That it's our relationship to God that affects our relationship to others. Let me say it another way because I don't want you to miss it. Our relationship with others is a reflection of our relationship to God. Our relationship to others is a reflection of our relationship to God. How does that affect you this morning? To be reminded of that. Friends, it's no accident that we need God in our lives. <clears throat> it's no sign of weakness or frailty that we need other people in our lives. That's the way God made us. It's totally contrary to the purpose of creation for us to try to live without Him and to live without other people in our lives. It just doesn't work that way because that's not how He designed it. But I do think it is a testimony to the fact that something is wrong. When we cannot admit that we need God and we cannot admit that we need others in our lives, that we can make it 
on our own. As I thought about this <clears throat> the past couple of weeks, I would say to anyone that says to me that, that that's the silliest, the stupidest, the most absurd thing that we could ever say. Because it contradicts God who made us the way He did. But the reality is that sin has intruded into the picture and brought with it isolation and alienation and estrangement and, and loneliness. Sin has caused us to play around with a silly, absurd notion that I don't need God and I don't need anybody else. So we have a part of our life that says, I don't need you, God. And a part of our lives that says, I don't need anybody else in my life either. I can make it on my own. But this passage reminds us of where relationships come into the picture. There is real value in relationships. Survival value. Real having it all together value. And how we desperately need to hear that today. Because we're living in a culture, as the statistic that I quoted just a minute ago said, no, we don't need God. We don't need other people in our lives. We're not that weak. And to say that we need God and to say that we need other people in our lives, don't do it. It just makes you too vulnerable. You cannot afford to let yourself be so unprotected. truth is, we were made for togetherness. And we must be reminded of how absolutely essential and valuable relationships are to healthy living. About two years ago, I had a dear friend who was my right hand in ministry and my work with the denomination whose wife came down with cancer. And we watched as she went through that process of illness, treatments of all kinds, finally to be taken as a result of the cancer. And I watched my friend as I interacted with him during that time, seeing how he hurt to see his wife suffer. I, I came to a realization that I need my wife far more than I ever knew that I needed her in my life. And I began to realize and assess just how dependent I am on her. And I pray to God that I'll never have to go through an experience of living without her. I don't mean that selfishly. I, I hope you will take me first. And you know, when I came to that realization, I realized that made me very vulnerable. To say, Colleen, I need you. My life would be incomplete without you. And so as I began to think, hey, that makes me vulnerable. That speaks of a sign of weakness. I said, yes, but that's the way God made me. That's the way it's supposed to be. But if you notice how expert we can be at taking such beautiful truths of God and perverting them? Friends, I'm not talking about something that's optional for us. It's not a matter of us choosing whether we need God and we need other people or not. God has already made that choice. We 
You don't have to keep fighting that battle. But sin continues to intervene and interrupt God's choice. And generally, the way sin interrupts is it causes us to go to extremes. One extreme is to say, I don't need anyone in my life. But any normal person, and I underscore the word normal, who says, I don't need anyone else in my life, and tries to live in alienation and loneliness. And here's something else that you interject that the article I was reading about those 300,000 people that were polled by the Brigham Young University team concluded that. Loneliness shortens a person's life at the same length as does alcoholism and smoking as many as 15 cigarettes a day. Loneliness causes an earlier death than obesity or being having a sedentary lifestyle. So that's one extreme. So I don't need anybody. So then, if we can't do that, then we go to the other extreme and we say, okay, if that's true, then I'm going to focus on building relationships that meet my needs because it's about me. Which translates into saying, I'm going to develop some self-centered relationships. And if my relationship with you doesn't meet my need, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk away from that relationship. <coughs> or if we say this relationship is just too painful for me, I can't have it, I'm going to look for a relationship that's less painful. And both are extremes. Because both pervert God's expectations. As I've said before, in all of our relationships, we operate with certain perceptions and certain expectations. Perceptions on how that relationship should be and expectations on how it's acted out. And we come to the point where we cherish our expectations of a relationship far more than we cherish the person in that relationship. And that's why we're living in a culture of throwaway relationships. It's tragic what we're experiencing in our culture. We actually believe that it's easier to walk away from a relationship than it is to alter our perception and expectations of those relationships. Because we've got to stay in our comfort zone, as we might say. Yeah, one of the messages of this passage in Philippians 2 which I believe is consistent with the entire message of the Bible, is that when, God, when we fail to meet God's expectations of us, He doesn't throw us off like a shoe. He doesn't walk away from us. He doesn't turn His back on us. But what this means is that I must constantly manage my relationships because relationships are not static, they're dynamic, they're always changing. And it's sheer fantasy to be in a relationship in which we say, I want it to be like this with nothing ever changing. That doesn't happen. Which means that we must be constantly monitoring our expectations of those relationships biblically. In order for them to be what God wants them to be. And the truth is, I can't change you. 
And you can't change me. But I can change me, and you can change you with the help of God. So we come to the place in our lives where we ask, how can I relate to God then in a way that pleases Him? In a way that fleshes out His plan and intentions for my life? And the answer is not that complicated. Actually, it's refreshingly simple. And that is that Christ must be the center of my life. My life has to center around Jesus Christ. Because as my Lord, He is my Creator and my Redeemer. I love working through this Philippians 2 passage, especially in, in the original Greek language. As I did that, several things impressed me. First of all, it's, it's essential that we have a right relationship with God and to each other. It is essential, as Paul says, to be unified and in fellowship with each other and to consider the other before we consider ourselves and that we concentrate first on meeting the needs of those around us. But against the backdrop of that, this text, I was reminded that I, we can't do that in our own strength. We can't do it alone. Because of the sin factor, it's not naturally in us to want to admit we need God and we need other people in our lives. But then I'm reminded that God's purpose is always fulfilled. It's always accomplished. No matter how much we fight against it, no matter how much we try to run away from it. And I was assured in this passage that I can have a right relationship with God and I can have a right relationship with people because of this one thing. Because Jesus Christ came to earth in the form of a human being. That's the message of the Christian faith. That's the message of hope. You see, my friends, if we put it in the right context, Christianity is a beautiful religion because if we're careful, the truth about God and the truth about ourselves can become a blessing to us. But we have to remember what God has done for us in creating us. But especially what He's done for us in our redemption and in our salvation. What He did was phenomenal in order to bring about healing relationships vertically and horizontally. That's the message of the Bible. It's the message of the good news of the kingdom of God. That's what St. Paul's is all about. And in Philippians 2, we have all of that beautifully summarized. For example, if you look at the first five verses of Philippians 2, Paul is talking about interpersonal relationships, vertically and horizontally. does that in a way to make us aware that something is extremely wrong with our relationships because the unity, the fellowship, and the joy are not always there in those relationships. Even, even in Philippians, I think it's the fourth chapter, Paul had to admonish two women in the church to stop arguing and get their act together by the name of Yodi and Sinai. Something's wrong. But not 
to leave us helplessly hopeless. Paul expostulates this great song of Christ. <coughs> so in verses 5 through 11, he presents us with the one who enables us to have the kind of relationships that are good and healthy and beautiful. And not only does he present to us the one who helps us to have those relationships as our enabler, he presents to us one who has given us the example of how to have those relationships. First of all, let's think about Christ as the enabler, as Paul talks about in here in Philippians 2. What can Jesus Christ do? Serious. To help us have the right kind of relationships. How can he help us? Paul tells us. Jesus Christ is God. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's equal to and is God. He didn't, Paul said, consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Any reference to Jesus is a reference to God. He is very God, a very God. He is everything that God is. He is the eternal Son of God. And in a few weeks, we're going to be thinking about the little baby in the manger at Christmas time. And as we think about the little baby in the manger, we must never forget who that little baby is. It is he is God. He has always been God and he always will be God. And that, my friends, is how he can help us build, restore, maintain unity, fellowship, and joy in our relationships. It's consistent with his plan to do that. You know the axiom. Two, obst two obstacles drawn closer to a common obstacle will of necessity be drawn closer to each other. The closer we come to God, the closer we come together. So when I refer to Jesus as the enabler of those relationships, I'm actually saying that God, with whom all things are possible, is the one that enables us to have right relationships with anyone. And I'm also reminding you that there is real, spiritual, interpersonal healing. Not to mention longevity of life in relationships. But in order to bring us that forgiveness, that healing, and the restoration, the Apostle Paul says, Jesus had to make himself Nothing, which we have time to talk about the Greek word there and what that really implies. He had to take upon himself the form of a servant, made in human likeness. The eternal Son of God had to become flesh and blood and walk among us. He had to become like we are in order to make us. He came to earth, Paul said, in the form of a servant. Obedient to the point of death for you and for me. And that's the only way our relationship to God and one another can be healed, restored, and maintained. What God had intended for us in the beginning, but the sin of Adam and Eve twisted and perverted. Jesus Christ came to fix it, to straighten, straighten it out. And that's why he took upon himself the form of a servant. That's why he identified with his people in such a holy manner. And in doing 
what he did, understand what an unnatural thing that was for God, the Creator, the Redeemer, to become one of us. Unheard of. And if we see in Jesus anything less than God loving us and God reconciling us to Him and to one another, becoming a servant to die on the cross for us, we miss the whole point. And if you miss that, you miss the unity and the joy and the fellowship that Paul talks about in horizontal as well as vertical relationships. It's Christ's death on the cross for us that enables us to be right with Him and with one another. There's no other way, and that's why He had to come in the form of a servant man. But understand this, when Christ became man, he didn't cease to be God. He came as a sinless man to die in our place. He was as fully God as though he were not man. But he was as fully man as though he were not God. Very deuce, very homo, as the Latin says. The truth is, that Jesus Christ, Paul says, is the God man who became a curse for us and humbled himself and became obedient to death on the cross. Now, again, I ask you, do you see the point that I'm trying to make from this passage? God made us to be at one with him and at one with one another. But sin came into the picture and caused those relationships to be fractured, even broken. But then God came in the person of Jesus Christ to do what needed to be done in order to put things back together. But in order for him to do that, he had to die. He had to die cursing death. That's why we must never forget who Jesus is. And what he has done for you and for me. He's our neighbor. But he's also our example. He has modeled for us what it's supposed to look like being a Christian. Paul says this in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Some translations would read, have this same attitude towards others that Christ has towards you. You see what I said earlier? Our relationship with others reflects our relationship to God and vice versa. <coughs> what does that mean? What he showed us. He didn't come to be ministered to. He came to minister. He didn't come to receive. He came to give. He humbled himself and became obedient to death on the cross. And that's the example that he set for us. That's the mind. That's the attitude that we're supposed to have towards him and others. It should permeate our lives. He looked not on his own interests but also to the interest of others. He came to die for us, to bring us back to God, and bring us back into relationship with each other. And because he did that, my friends, there is only one thing and one thing only that can break our relationship with God and that can break our relationship with one another, and that's unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin. And by unconfessed sin, following Paul, I mean wrong attitudes. Wrong feelings about others. When we sin in our minds and our hearts, 
We contradict everything that God has intended for us not to do. You remember Jesus said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I love you? That's in the Old Testament. That's in the New Testament. And that's a commandment for us today. And the astonishing thing is that Jesus doesn't just tell us we have to have this kind of love. He shows us how to have it and to express it. I wish I could go on. You may be, I'm, I'm awake. Some of you may be sitting there this morning trying to process what I'm trying to tell you I think the Apostle Paul said. And you may be thinking, well, Charles, that sounds a little bit naive because you don't understand. There's this certain person in my life that I can't relate to. It's just not in my heart to do it. There's no way that I can do that. There's just nothing there anymore. That relationship has died. Really? What about Jesus Christ? Where is He in the midst of those relationships? Yes, Charles, but you don't understand. I've tried this and I've tried that and nothing seems to work. And it's just too painful for me to try to continue in that relationship. I just don't have any more to give to it. Really? Yes, Charles, I, I, I don't. I've prayed about it, and I've prayed about it, and nothing seems to affect that relation, that damaged relationship. So I've got to walk away. Because that relationship is still damaged, and I can't do anything else. Again, really? When did you lay down your life for that relationship? what Jesus did for us and that's the example that he shows us and because he's shown us how to do that and he enables us to do that there is absolutely no excuse for us to be involved in perverted twisted damaged relationships absolutely none there's no excuse for bitterness and anger in our relationships not in light of Christ's enabling power and his example. So I have to say this morning, if we have a damaged relationship with our spouse, or with a family member, or a church member, or a co-worker, or a neighbor, that's our choice. But it's not God's. He's chosen otherwise. But I know you're still saying, but Charles, I've been so abused and misused and, and hurt. I can't have the attitude of Christ in that relationship. I can't do it. My friends, of course you can. You don't have to. Because Christ comes to enable us to do what he tells us to do and to show us how. Plus, he's given us the Holy Spirit when we believe to help us. Now, now let me give a caveat, and this is another story that I don't have time to get into, but I need to say it so you'll know. I am well aware that there are some relationships that should have never been entered into first place. And there are some relationships that shouldn't be continued because the people involved are such codependent emotional cripples because of that relationship. And there have been a few occasions and I don't like to admit it but I must where I've had to counsel couples for a period of separation or even in a few extreme cases 
divorce because of what that relationship was doing to both of them emotionally and spiritually. The lack of forgiveness was consuming them. I want to close this morning with an incredible story that I read several years ago in the New York Times about a mother who was practically destroyed by the rape and murder of her college-age daughter in San Diego, going to the University of San Diego. And the mother, for months and months, struggled, and she couldn't let go of that awful thing. She was angered, she was bitter, she hated everybody, she didn't even want to be around people. sudden she began to realize that she was destroying herself. She couldn't move forward. If there was nothing she could do, she thought to change that. She had become what we would call an emotional cripple. The memory of her murdered daughter was hanging over her head like a devastating cloud and it was destroying her. Pretty soon she thought, I've got to do something. So she started writing the murderer in prison. And the letters would come back, and she persisted. And as she persisted, at one point, the murderer responded. Then she took a second step and said to, to the murderer, I will visit you. I want to know you. And after a time, the murderer of her daughter agreed that they could come. So she and her husband went to the prison to meet this man that had murdered her husband because she said, I want to know him. I want to know what he's like. And she describes this, by the way, in a beautiful little book that she wrote after after all of this had, had moved on. And she tells about her husband, she and her husband standing in that waiting room, waiting on the prisoner, the murderer, to come in. And she said, all of a sudden the door is open, and he walked in. And she said, I looked at him, and I thought, well, he's a man like other men. He had dark hair, he had dark eyes, he had on a clean prison uniform. He looked at her and dropped his head. And she said, all of a sudden, there was a lightness in my soul. And all I could do was reach out to this man. So she and her husband reached out to the man who murdered her daughter and embraced him. You know, and the three of them stood there in, in the vis visitor's room weeping together. And her testimony was, at that moment, I was liberated. I was liberated. And now for the rest of the story. She went back. And she wrote about this incident in the article that appeared in the New York Times. Lots of people, lots of people began to ask her, write her and contact her, would you come and speak to my group about this incredible experience? And she said, there was seldom a group that I addressed where I wasn't attacked by someone saying, you're a stupid, naive woman. You could not have loved your daughter very much if you forgave that man who murdered her. To which her reply was, I'm going to leave retribution to heaven. In the meantime, I'm going to forgive. That took real inner strength for that mom. Do that. 
God doesn't intend for us to live lonely, isolated. He doesn't intend for our relationships to be less than honoring to Him. If we have a picture of Christ the enabler and Christ the example in this passage of Scripture clearly before us, we will know there is help and there is hope. And hurt relationships can be made well. There can be unity and fellowship and joy, not only in our relation with God, but, but to one another. There can be a life-giving attitude of myself to others. It would be Christ-like. Our relationship to others reflects our relationship to Christ. What did we learn about your relationship to God this morning? We observe how you relate to others. It's all about Christ. And what's symbolized in this communion table is the truth and the relationships that are centered in Christ. This is a communion coming together to remember how what Paul said Christ has done for us bring us together vertically in horizontally. There may be some repentance that's needed in your life this morning. Don't come to the table if there is until you have repented and reached out to make those relationships right. Vertically and horizontally. But if there are no unconfessed sins in your life this morning, come and thank God for what Jesus has done. And he invites us to come to the table and remember in order for us to have unity and joy and fellowship with one another and with him. Father, help us this morning. You've spoken to us very clearly in your word, and I pray that my words have not confused or distorted. I pray that the Holy Spirit will teach us and help us to apply what we've learned and to do what we need to do in order to bring honor to your name. You know our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.